couple of weeks ago, um, I read an article that talked about how recent IPL cricket auctions were life-changing for several cricket players. That list of players included Ben Stokes, who's one of my favorite British cricketers, and he was quoted in the article saying, I was following it on Twitter. I didn't actually see it live. I kept on refreshing my notifications. I saw people were tweeting, and then I realized that Pune had got me. Why am I sharing this anecdote with you all? Well, for one, I can talk about cricket in this country without having to explain myself. Um, and as you can tell, I love talking about cricket. But more importantly, it ties very closely to our jobs to be done framework. And we want to keep our users informed about the world. The other thing is it also showcases one of the prime use cases of Twitter, where people come to Twitter to follow a live event and to hear the real world commentary around it. And for both of these use cases, my team plays a very central role. Um, and we, we enable these use cases by notifying users about what's happening in their world in real time. The key to highlight here is their world and real time. And during the talk today, we'll focus on why these two are important. My name is Saurabh Pathak. I manage notifications team at Twitter. I'm here today with Gary Lamb, who's the lead engineer in my team. Today, we'll be giving a high-level overview of notifications. Then we'll talk about some of the main challenges we face scaling it. Um, and then we'll go over how our infrastructure solves them. After that, we'll go over the evolution of notifications. Um, uh, and broadly, there are three categories that we'll cover today. We'll start with triggered notifications, and then we'll talk about uh, personalized fan out and recommendations. So let's start. Uh, before, uh, before we start, let's do a quick show of hands. Um, raise your hands if you have used Twitter notifications in the past. It's awesome. Um, for, for those who did not raise your hands, I'll have to find you and start sending you notifications. Um, but for um, your benefit, I'll give a quick recap of, recap of the four main channels we use to notify our users. The, the first one is notification timeline. This is an in-app experience. You go to your timeline to see a reverse chronological history of all your notifications. It acts as a pivot for the product. Then there's push. It's a heavily used channel. It ties very closely to the core of Twitter, which is Twitter is live, and these notifications are real time. One of the most common push notification is uh, account notification. Um, through account notification, you can opt in to be notified every time someone tweets. Um, and that's, that comprises of a huge volume for push. And then there is our OG channel. Uh, some of you might not be aware, but Twitter actually started as a group send SMS service. And so SMS is still relevant for us. Uh, apart from some product cases, we use it for sending login codes and uh, two-factor authorization and whatnot. And then finally, email. It's the oldest messaging channel, channel on internet. And it's still pretty relevant for us. Now let's switch gears and talk about some of the main challenges that we face. And they have a bearing on how our architecture has evolved over time. The first one I want to highlight is notifications are bimodal. What I mean there is if you were to plot the number of notifications received by users for all of Twitter users, you'll see a power law-like distribution where there are two major categories of users. There are users like me who get a handful of notifications on a given day, and then there are these heavy users. They receive a ton of engagement. These tend to be your celebrities, your politicians, news reporters, and people who have gone viral. So as a product, um, this creates challenges uh, that have bearing on the infrastructure. So for instance, for these heavy users, they, they get a ton of engagement, so they get a ton of notifications, and we want to make sure we deliver those to them in real time. On the other extreme, people who do not get a lot of notifications, 
um, are the ones who do not tweet a lot. They are the consumers. Um, and for them, the challenge is to figure out the right content that, or, or right notifications that will bring value to their, uh, to their experience. As all of you are aware, Twitter is a very spiky product. Here's a good example of that. And this is from 2013, so it's slightly dated. But um, this was from, um, uh, in Japan, they were rebroadcasting an, an anime uh, called Castle in the Sky. And something must have happened during that where suddenly all the Japanese users took to Twitter and started tweeting it. And it created a tweets per second record for us back then. Um, and then we started receiving hundreds of thousands of notifications, uh, tweets per second. And as you can imagine, every time there's a tweet spike, there's a corresponding notification spike. Related to that, Twitter is highly asymmetric, um, unlike some other social networks. You have cases where people like Elon Musk who have millions of followers. So every time uh, Elon Musk tweets, we have to fan out his tweet to all of his followers. And just like tweet fan out, there is notifications fan out. So every time he tweets, we have to find out all the users who we need to notify and then deliver that notification to them in real time. So to round off an overview of our challenges, I'll, I'll briefly mention the four main challenges that we face. And uh, by no means, this is an exhaustive list. There are a lot more both from product and infrastructure point of view, but I want to highlight them today because we'll also talk about how we solve or how we address some of these challenges. Latency is the most obvious one. Twitter is live. We want to make sure that from the time someone tweets to the time you get notified um, is, is minimal. We don't want to introduce much latency, otherwise it uh, takes away from the experience. I spoke about notification spikes and fan out. Again, uh, we have to make sure that we not only scale up to handle billions of notifications every day, but we can also handle these sudden spikes. Heterogeneity is something that's there for a lot of distributed systems, and it's the case for notifications. And what I mean there is if you look at all the calls that our services make, uh, our notification services make, you can split them into two major categories. There are there are calls that are serviced via cache or uh, a, a fast data store, which tend to be anywhere from a few milliseconds to, let's say, tens of milliseconds. And then there are external calls that we make to Google and uh, iOS, which can take anywhere from half a second to a second. And uh, when you have these two sets of calls, um, it's not as simple as just horizontally scaling up. You have to be cognizant of how you are coupling or actually not coupling them. And then finally, for any app like Twitter, uh, we need to make sure that we are resilient. And for that, we need to make sure that our users can get their notifications even if we were to fail over. And um, in general, we need to make sure that we can handle multiple data centers. So let's talk about how our infrastructure addresses some of these challenges. And I'll, for the, uh, sake of time, I'll, be very, uh, I'll, I'll give you a very high-level overview. Each of this topic is something I can talk uh, for the entire duration, but uh, let's uh, give a quick overview. So this is our push architecture, which is uh, used to send push SMS and email notifications. And uh, uh, at a very high level, uh, we receive notifications, and then there is some business, business logic that we apply, things like uh, make sure your settings are being honored, uh, we check for spam, abuse, whatnot, and so Bunch of business rules are applied, and then once a notification passes all of them, it's then sent out for delivery, and then it eventually gets to your devices. So for this architecture, the, the three main challenges are, of course, we want to keep latency low because push, is a, is a, as I said, is a live um, uh, use case, live channel. Um, we have to be able to deal with spikes, which happen all the time. And uh, the problem with spikes is uh, you cannot predict when they happen. So um, I used to work at Netflix, and there they could rely on predictive auto scaling, but we cannot do that because we have no idea when the next spike is going to come. And then I mentioned the heterogeneity. So how do we deal with latency and spikes? Well, 
we rely on horizontal scaling, but that's not enough. Um, we need to make sure that when we scale up uh, or, or when we have a sudden upsurge of a spike or uh, uh, notifications uh, traffic, we don't bring our upstream services down because, um, uh, as I said, notifications are asymmetric, and so it, it's very common for us to be have um, millions of events in our queue that are all referring to the same user, and if, we, if each of these processes start calling for the same user, that service will be, will be down. So we rely on lots of short-lived caches. Um, Usually, when you, have, you put caching in place, you optimize for cache hit rate. For us, it's totally fine to have cache misses in the beginning. Um, and given that these spikes are short-lived, short-lived caches, caches totally suffice our use cases. In terms of heterogeneity, there are two main ways we, we handle them. So, as I said, we have different types of notifications and different types of calls. And we, have, we, we rely heavily on priority queues to make sure that, for instance, your login codes are not being delayed because there's a backlog uh, because Katy Perry just tweeted. So we need to decouple them, and we do that via priority queues. And then the second thing is um, we make sure that calls that, take, um, that have similar latency profile are queued separately. So if there's a delay due to a Google outage or slowdown, we are not delaying other notifications. So that was the push architecture. For notifications timeline, we use a pull architecture. Uh, and at a very high level, same thing, notifications um, are uh, um, uh, received via, by our write path. They're typically received asynchronously, but we have some synchronous use cases. Um, we apply a set of business rules. And again, in this case, instead of pushing them out for delivery, we store them in um, a backing data store, and they are cached. And these caches are long-lived caches. Um, and the idea there is every time you visit your notifications timeline, it should be served out of cache. It's very rare that it's not served out of cache because it's a very costly operation to uh, generate your timeline on the fly. So the, the two main challenges here are, again, latency, um, which is obvious. We want to make sure that we're not taking forever to uh, load up your notifications timeline, because otherwise you'll switch to something else. And the other thing is multi-DC. We need to make sure that in the event of fail, failover or whatnot, we can deliver your notifications timeline to you and in a timely manner. So from a latency point of view, we use a custom implementation of uh, Redis. And um, I'm not sure if you guys attended Yao's talk on Monday. She talked about our caching architecture. It's a very good talk. You should check it out. Uh, but as I said, these, we rely on long-lived caches. And um, we also store all of our notifications in Manhattan, which is our uh, real-time uh, distributed backing store. And it's uh, um, built for availability, because that's the most important thing for us. From a multi-DC point of view, we, of course, do cross-CC replication, but that's not enough. We need to make sure that if you, you were to move from one data center to the other, your notifications stay the same. Otherwise, it'll be a very jarring experience. Um, and so for that, we, have, uh, we, we siphon off a small volume of notifications and um, is off, um, uh, in a separate asynchronous queue, we make sure that, that we compare notifications across data centers and make sure that they are the same. And if they are not same, uh, we need to figure out what's going on. Um, we also have maintenance job to make sure that our caches are not growing out of bounds um, and just doing house cleaning, uh, which we don't, do not need to do while we are handling uh, our real-time events. If you're building a notification infrastructure, there are these two things I want to highlight which you should uh, uh, think about building in. Um, one is you want to make sure that it's very straightforward to add any notifications. Otherwise, your experiment velocity will be very slow. So most of our new notifications are pretty much self-serve or templated. The second thing is we, you want to ensure that your notifications and your experiments are driven purely on the backend side. And the reason I mention this is 
Um, as you can imagine, Twitter is on all, all possible apps. And uh, if I have to add a new notification, and if I have to chase down iOS team and then Android team and make sure that I uh, figure out when is their next release and they're never aligned, and before, um, uh, before you know, you have wasted months trying to add a new experiment. And so we do not have, we used to live in that world a long time ago, and we have moved away from that. And most of our new experiments are now server-side driven, and it is responsible for our high experiment velocity. So from our infrastructure point of view, before we wrap, wrap it up, uh, I want to mention these three key takeaways. Um, again, there was a talk on Monday where uh, there was a really good talk where we talked about um, sync versus async, and that's a trade-off we make all the time. And for our distributed systems, you should, you should always rely on asynchronicity. Asynchronicity is your friend. Try to make sure that you have as minimal synchronous operations as possible, because it's very hard to scale things up. So in our um, notifications infrastructure, we rely on very few synchronous operations. And wherever possible, we try to move away from them. Similarly, we make trade-offs between write and read path. And the idea there is you need to be cognizant of what you're doing at write time. There are certain things you can do in write time, but you shouldn't. Uh, for instance, when we cache stuff, we only cache our IDs. We do not uh, cache data for them because we want to do that at the read time so that we give you the most up-to-date information. Similarly, uh, on the flip side, when we show you an aggregated timeline, most of that aggregation happens at read time. There's no point doing it at write time. And then we talked about multi-DC, but uh, in this day and age, you need to be very uh, even if you're starting off a, uh, an app with just one data center, make sure that you are aware of how you would scale it up to, or how you would evolve it to have multiple data centers. Now let's go over the evolution of Twitter notifications. So we started off with this category of notifications, which are by far the highest volume. They're called triggered notifications. As you can imagine, they are triggered by an interaction on Twitter. So for instance, if I were to tweet, and if you were to reply or like, it'll generate a like notification or a reply notification. So again, these are the highest volume notifications by far. As I mentioned, we generate billions of them every day. Um, we need to make sure that not only we do that, but we can handle spikes. And I talked about bimodality in the beginning, um, but triggered notifications are highly bimodal, um, a small minority of users receive majority of these notifications. A quick example of how they flow in our system. Someone tweets, goes through a right path, and then there we apply all our business uh, rules and logic, and then once it passes that, it's forked off onto two different paths. One path is real time. It leads to your device as a push and the other path is where it's stored and then served out of cache. So why, why do we need personalization? Why are triggered notifications not enough? The reason they're not enough is there is a lot more happening on Twitter, uh, both outside your graph and within your graph, that triggered notifications do not cover. They cover a subset of those use cases, but they are not enough. For instance, if I'm a, uh, let's say I'm a Warriors fan, um, and I follow, follow Warriors account, um, and then there is some controversy during a game, and if Warriors account doesn't tweet it, I would never know about it. But if, if Twitter knows that I'm interested in Warriors, they could notify me in real time with an upcoming trend and whatnot. As I mentioned in the beginning, we notify users about what's happening in their world in real time. We cover, trigger notifications cover the real time part of it, but uh, there's a lot more that we do with personalization that Gary will talk about, so I'll hand it over to him. Thank you, Sarb. So this is where I'm gonna talk about personalization. Personalization comes down to notifying our users about their interests. You only wanna hear about things you're interested in. And there's two ways we do personalization at Twitter. The first, we call personalized fan out. 
Previously, we talked about fan out. When Elon Musk tweets, we have to send it to other followers that have subscribed to them. But Elon Musk tweets about space because he's the CEO of SpaceX, and he also tweets about electric cars because he's CEO of Tesla. You might not be interested in space, but you might be interested in electric cars. So we only want to notify you when Elon Musk tweets about electric cars. And this is what personalized fan out does. I'm going to walk you through the personalized fan out algorithm. So we mentioned we need to keep track of a user's interest. We want to notify you about your interests. So we keep track of your recent engagements on entities. Let's break this down. Engagements are likes, tweets, replies. When you tweet about a particular topic, we call that an engagement or when you like somebody else's tweet. We, we bunch this up into something we call engagements. Entities. These are hashtags, accounts, or it can be something more abstract, like a particular topic. It could be movies, sports. So we keep track of your engagements on these things we call entities. So to make this more concrete, for me, for example, I'm currently in London, so I've tweeted about hashtag London. And this is being QCon, and I want to keep up with everybody's great talks. I've been favoriting and liking and retweeting all of your tweets about QCon. So I have recently engaged with London and QCon. So those are my recent engagements. So we keep track of these engagements as a proxy to what your interests are. And we only keep track of your recent engagements because Twitter is constantly changing. The data on Twitter, what people are talking about on Twitter are constantly changing as well as your interests. You maybe have been interested in the Super Bowl or the Oscars a month or two months ago. You're not so interested in that right now. So we need to keep track of your most recent engagements. The second part to personalize fan out is your followings. So when we mean followings, my followings are the users I follow. You follow a lot of people on Twitter, but not every single person you follow means the same to you. There are some people that you really want to hear from, and there are others that you might not want to hear from them so much. So for every user, we want to keep track of who are the very, very top followings. Who are the people that they really, really want to hear, hear about? So for me, for example, I'm a Twitter employee. So Twitter is one of my top followings. And QCon London, I want to hear about everybody's talks. QCon London tweets a lot about it. So I follow maybe hundreds of people on Twitter. But in personalized fan out, we would only use the top view. In this case, we would take top two in the simplified example. So to recap, we have your recent engagements on entities, and we also have your top followings. And I want to walk through an example of what happens when QCon London tweets and when personalized fan out decides whether they want to send it to me or not. So first thing, when QCon London tweets, we extract out the entity from the tweet. In this case, we're looking at hashtags, so hashtag London is the entity. We then look whether I have recently engaged on hashtag London, which I have because I'm at QCon in London. And then we look at the author of the tweet and whether the author is in my top end followings. So then we decide, hey, we'll send this QCon tweet to Lam Gary. And the reason this is a hard problem, like a lot of problems at Twitter, is because it's asymmetric. If you look at Katy Perry, she has millions and millions of followers. To make it clear, what we're not doing is looking at Katy Perry and sending it to her top 20 followers. Because then there will be a huge fight to become the top 20th of 20 followers of Katy Perry. And we'd upset a lot of people. What we're doing is we're taking everybody that follows Katy Perry and seeing if Katy Perry is in one of the top followings. So you compare Katy Perry to someone slightly less popular, like me. I might only have one or two people who, who, are in my top, who, who want to hear from me. So how do we solve this? So we solve this by co-location and no network lookups. OK, what does, let's deep dive into this. What we do is we shard by every user. So each user belongs to a particular shard. I would belong into, say, shard one. Sarb would belong into shard two. And on each one of these shards, for every user, we keep track of their, top engage, their recent engagements and their top followings. And they're all on the same shard. 
What this means is when we run the personalized fan out algorithm, we don't have to do network lookups to other services. Everything's done locally, so we don't incur any latency by hitting other ex external services. It also scales well because we've sharded your recent engagements and sharded your followings, so we can scale horizontally that way. And the keynote here is all of these shards listen to the same copy of the firehose. So each one of these are running their personalized final algorithm on the users that belong to that shard. So let's walk through an example of what happens when Katy Perry actually tweets. So Katy Perry tweets, Katy here, I lost a bet for best picture, I wanted Moonlight. So this was tweeted during the Oscars. If uh, a lot of you might know during the Oscars, they announced that La La Land won Best Picture, and then they kind of, uh, they made a mistake there, and then they announced that Moonlight won. So this, Katy Perry tweeted this out before they fixed their mistake. But back to this problem, what we have, supposing you live in a world where you have two shards. You have shard one, and you have shard two. And we're gonna look at two of Katy Perry's followers, follower A and follower B. So follower A is on shard one, and on shard one, we keep track of follower A's engagements. In this case, follower A has engaged with La La Land, and Katy Perry is one of the top followings. On shard two, follower B is a fan of Moonlight, and they've also followed Katy Perry as one of the top followings. So what happens in personalized fan out is, again, the first thing we do, extract out the entity from the tweet. In this case, the entity is Moonlight, the movie. We then send that tweet to every single personalized fan out shard. So all of these shards get it and they run the algorithm. And as I mentioned before, we look at the engagements. Only follower B has engaged with Moonlight, so we'd only send this to follower B and not follower A. So in this way, we're able to notify you about people you care about and only about the interests that you care about. So we talked about why we need to co-locate our data. I'm gonna deep dive now more into how we make this efficient. And the key is data pre-processing. I'm gonna go a bit backwards on this slide. I'm gonna go from your right down to the left. So first off, the recent engagements on entities, we store that in memory. The reason we store in memory is your recent engagements are short-lived. As I mentioned before, we keep, you're not interested in something from two months ago. So we keep maybe a couple of hours up to a day's worth of your recent engagements in memory. Which is good, we don't persist it as any for anywhere else because it's not useful anymore. After a day or two, this data isn't really gonna be useful. But the problem comes when your shard goes down. We work out of a data center, there's maintenance jobs, things go down all the time. All of you are probably aware of this. And when you go down, then you lose your in-memory recent engagements. At this point, we can't just go, oh, sorry, we're not gonna send you notifications, right? Because all the Katy Perry fans will get really angry. So what we do is we need to make sure these personalized fan out shards come up very, very quickly. And the way we do it is we read from a queue. This queue has the last, say, 24 hours of recent engagements. And on startup, we consume from this queue very quickly to rebuild this in-memory engagement graph. And there are two things that we do to make this efficient. The first is batching. By batching your engagements together, you reduce the message overhead, and this typically gives us a, a huge speed up. The second thing we do is, if you ever use the Firehose, and you looked at the Twitter JSON data, it contains a lot of metadata. So it has things like what client the, tw the, the user used. Was it iOS, was it Android? Uh, which country, perhaps, they tweeted from? Uh, what time of day, the actual tweet text? There's all this metadata in there that aren't relevant for personalized fan out. So we extract out only the key pieces of metadata, for example, maybe just the user ID and the tweet ID that they've engaged with. So we, that's why we call it a slim fire hose and it's batched. So in this way, we're able to launch per personalized fan out shards in a matter of minutes if they ever go down. And the other good thing about this is the entity extraction. So figuring out on the tweet which movies or hashtags it is sometimes can be quite an expensive process, and we do this in the Slim Engagement service. What this means is we do the entity extraction once, and then we send that result to all the personal, uh, personalized fan out shards, which means we save on that computation, and you can put some more expensive computations in the entity extraction. So this is recent engagements. 
The next is how do we preset process the top followings? So to find the top followings for every user, we run an offline machine learning algorithm. And this is based off your historical, in, historical interaction between the two users. For example, whether you're likely to like that person's tweet, whether you have similar friends, follow similar people on Twitter. We calculate this offline because your, your friends and your top followings don't change that often. Friendships are built over months and years, even in this modern age. Uh, so running it offline allows us to make it reliable and scale correctly. And after we've calculated the top end followings for every single user, we partition it. And we partition it in the same way that we partition our production rec service shards. So if we have n rec service shards, uh, rent personalized fan out shards, sorry, rec service is what we call it internally, personalized fan out shards, um, we would have n partitions on HDFS. And we pre-partition this, so when we bring up a shard, supposing we bring up shard three, it just copies that piece of data from HDFS onto its local disk. And after we've copied it to local disk, we don't actually load it into memory immediately. This is because your followings graph is typically pretty large. You don't want to waste all that memory on something that is, is so large. So what we do is we lazily load it into memory as it's required. Um, so in this way, the recent engagements, as we bring up the shard, we process back from a queue, build it up very quickly. The top end followings, we simply copy from HDFS onto uh, the local disk of that shard. So the key takeaways for personalized fan out is co-locate your data. Once you've co-located your data, you no longer have external network lookups. You can scale horizontally that way. But in order to do this efficiently, you really need to rely on data pre-processing. Pre-process your engagements, make sure that's efficient, pre-process your following graphs so you partition it correctly. But the third key takeaway here is real-time personalization is actually very expensive. We had to do a lot of pre-processing to make sure this all works efficiently. This impacts our iteration speed. If someone has a new idea, they have to write, their pre they have to write a pre-processing pipeline, pre-process this data before they can experiment with that. And the other thing that makes real-time personalization so expensive is we're listening to the fire hose. Things are spiky on Twitter. We've talked about that a lot. If you look at Hillary Clinton, her, when she got nominated for the Democratic as a Democratic nominee, her mentions and people who were interested in it spiked many, many different times, many times the, the average volume. So in order for personalized fan out to scale to this volume, we need to over allocate on capacity to make sure we handle this. And because this is very unpredictable, we waste a lot of resources by having to over allocate. So this brings us to our second way of doing personalization, which is recommendations. In personalized fan out, what we saw was we send you the best content from the people you follow. But as Sarah mentioned earlier, your, there's content on Twitter that you don't explicitly follow that will be interesting to you. There are a few examples on that slide, on that slide over there. Uh, but what we're trying to do is look at your interests, look at uh, your followers and friends, look at what they're interested in and try to recommend you good content. For example, if I didn't know about QCon, but three or four of my colleagues came to QCon, tweeted a lot about it, maybe you're interested in QCon too. So the goal here is to find content you love even though you don't explicitly follow it. And the reason why we have a second way of doing personalization is because it scales a lot better. And in this recommendations world, what we're gonna do is relax the real-time constraint. What we're gonna do is not read from the fire hose, but instead control the own load by ourselves. What does this mean? So we have a very tight loop, and in this loop, we literally go, ev go over every single user on Twitter. The number of users on Twitter is much more predictable than the number of events or tweets. So in this way, we're able to predict our capacity much better. And by controlling the load ourselves, this allows us to scale and be much more efficient with our resources. But again, as I emphasize, what we're sacrificing is latency. As events happening on Twitter, no longer are we sending out 
to you in a matter of seconds, but there might be uh, a delay of a couple of minutes because we're looping over every single user at Twitter. And what loop service does is it triggers another component called fatigue, fetch, and rank. So fatigue, fetch, and rank is another service that I'm going to walk everyone through right now. First off, fatigue. In this stage, we're able to figure out where the user lies on that bimodal distribution that we talked about. Are there someone that receives a lot of notifications, in which case we don't want to send them anymore? Or are there someone that, who could do with more recommendations to help them get the most value out of Twitter? And we have what we call a history store. We keep track of your historical open rate for notifications, whether you like these notifications, whether you engage with them. So we're, we know whether you want notifications or not. And this works well for both the user, because they don't get notified if they don't like notifications. And it's also good for us, because we don't waste computation capacity calculating and doing things for users who aren't going to see it in the end. Once we pass the fatigue stage, we know at this point we're likely wanting to send the notification to the user. In this fetch stage, what we do is we look up many, many different candidate sources. So a candidate source is an interface that we defined, and it's very simple. There's a user ID is as a key, and the value that it returns from it is just a list of possible notifications that may be relevant to that user. So in this fetch stage, we fetch from many different content sources, so we're more likely to find something that's relevant to the user. We would have a separate content source for each type of content we would recommend. For example, we would have one for hashtags, we would have one for photos, we would have one for follower recommendations. And at the other good thing about this is if a person has a new idea and wants to experiment with a new candidate source, for example, maybe they just want to recommend good technical presentations, they could create a new candidate source for that and plug it into our pipeline very seamlessly. No longer do they have to do a lot of pre-processing and, and all of this um, data pre uh, uh, logic that's inflexible like we saw in personalized fan out. And typically, these candidate sources can be backed by other services. A typical one we use at Twitter is GraphJet. So GraphJet is a real-time graph processing library that we've open sourced at Twitter. Check it out on GitHub. Es essentially, what it does, it looks at your followers and looks at the tweets of your followers. And it does a random walk across these to find the best content for you. Not only can we back candidate sources with other services, they can also be generated offline. So we have Scalding, which is our offline MapReduce pipeline framework that we use at Twitter to generate this data. And we can store that in Manhattan, and we can then load that out from a data set. So these candidate sources, super flexible, and they're easy to plug in into the fetch stage. Once we fetch all these candidates, we're going to rank them with a machine learning model. If we have 100 candidates, we're not going to send all 100 to the user. That would be impractical, and uh, the user would just be overwhelmed. So we choose the best one to send to it. And we do this based off of your historical engagement, whether you like photos more, whether you like hashtags more. And we also look at the social proof. For example, if six of your friends have liked a particular photo versus another photo that only two of your friends have liked, we're more likely to recommend the one with, uh, six, uh, that six of your friends have liked. And once we figured out the best notification to send, we send this out to our, through our notification infrastructure. So this is what Sarab talked about, where we do uh, the notification timeline and, the, and push notifications. I want to go one level deeper. We mentioned our machine learning model. Twitter is a data and experimentation driven company. So we need to collect data. And data is really what drives uh, our machine learning models. So at each one of our services, we log our information back to HDFS. For example, in the, fetch, in the rank stage, we would uh, log perhaps the score that the machine learning model gave all the candidates and save that to HDFS. We also instrument all of our clients. So when you open the notification or whether you give us an explicit signal that you don't like notifications, we have this information on HDFS as well. What we do, we turn these into machine learning features and labels. They feed in not only to notifications, but potentially into your ranked timeline, your ranked home timeline as well. And then we generate a new machine learning model off of this new collected data. So in this aspect, as Twitter is constantly changing, we're adapting our models to reflect that. So by this, in, the, in this way, we're able to deliver you relevant recommendations. 
So to sum up the recommendations section, we relaxed our real-time constraint and we took control of our load. We can predict our load because we're not subject to the spiky nature of the fire hose anymore. This is really more personalized because we have a diverse set of content sources. We're looking at many different content sources compared to personalized fan out, so you're more likely to find something that's relevant to the user. We run that through a machine learned model, and to power these, you really need data. I want to bring everything together we talked about today. So at the beginning, we talked about our notifications infrastructure. This was our scalable infrastructure that powers the notifications timeline and allows us to send push email and SMS to our users. And then what we walked you through is actually a sliding scale of three systems from the real time to the personalized. So in the real time world, we showed you trigger notifications. These are based off your interaction where users have an expectation of delivery and we send these out in real time. Then we talked about personalized fan out. You might not want to, you want to be notified about your interests from people you follow. We saw here we're able to do real time personalization, but it comes as a cost of inflexibility and very expensive capacity. And then we moved to a world where we're in recommendations, where we're extremely personalized, where we can deliver extremely relevant notifications to the user, but we had to sacrifice on the latency. So the key takeaway I want everyone to walk away with today, as you're building out your new architecture, think about where your product or where your use case lies from the real time to the personalized world. You have, you, there's a trade off between all of them and hopefully what we showed you today will allow you to make a better, better informed decision about that. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, follow us on Twitter and I guess we'll open it up for a Q&A right now. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, what programming languages do you use uh, for this stuff? So we are predominantly uh, uh, Scala house for the, all the back end and front end services we use Scala. Yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I actually work on a news recommendation um, infrastructure, and I was interested in terms of the candidate sources. So say you have a candidate source that does collaborative filtering for you, uh, yep. and then you have your re-ranking step where you integrate all the sources. Yep. In. So do you uh, pass along any features from your candidate sources so you make sure that maybe you have a very interesting candidate source, but it's being ranked very low because you don't have uh, proper representation for that in your re-ranking step. Yeah, so typically we don't do that because your, candidate, your features that belong to your candidate sources are very specific to that candidate source. And if you're trying to rank across multiple candidate sources, those features won't be that helpful. So you really want features that are uh, common to all of your candidate sources. All right. All right, thanks for the great talk. Um, you mentioned that uh, you rely on the data processor of your entities, right? So uh, how hard is to do it and how hard is to define or to find your entity or not to it? Sorry, can you repeat the two questions? Uh, how hard is for you guys to define what is an entity and preprocess that in order to have uh, everything right. else that you mentioned? Yeah, it's a, so entities like hashtags and authors are pretty easy to extract but you can imagine mapping to an interest is a pretty hard problem, and uh, there's, a, there's a lot of people working on that on Twitter. Yeah. But, but Twitter is full of entities. I mean, everything, um, a user is an entity, so an entity could be following another entity, or a hashtag is an entity, or an image could be an entity, or interest could be an entity. Um, so we, we have a taxonomy of interest. We have all of that predefined, and if you were to add something, um, uh, it's... I mean, some of these things are, uh, they, they don't change on a day-to-day -day -day basis. Like, you might have different hashtags, but they're still a hashtag. Uh, yeah, great talk. A couple questions. Oh, one was, uh, so you pick a candidate source. You mentioned hashtag, photos, accounts to follow, right? Yeah. Uh, and then you pick one, and then you rank the results for those. 
And you mentioned that you don't have features across because they're all sort of different entities and they're going to be normalized differently, right? Um, but some, you know, in search, for example, they usually do slotting. And they say slot one, slot two, slot three, and then they pick uh, three, three, three or something, and they rank individually. And they mean, so why don't you guys try slotting? So notifications uh, tend to be more focused on uh, the chronology. So like the, the value you get out of it is more about uh, chronologically sorted, reverse chronologically sorted uh, ones. So we don't want to just artificially inject diversity for the sake of slotting. But if something is highly relevant to you, um, then it'll be injected in. I mean, so you, you give up blending. So for example, I can't get a blended photo plus hashtag because you're, you're afraid that it's going to mess up your ranking. So blending exactly. happens in real time. Because if you yeah. blended it, you'd have this problem of uh, you would go like photo, hash, uh, person, photo, hash, person. But then they have different ranking normalization. So that would mess it up. So that's why people do slotting. Right? They'd say, here's all the photos. And you'd have the top three photos. Here's the people, top three people. Here's the hashtag, top three. Hashtag, and they're using different ranking algorithms and features. So, the, so we try to do that kind of way to avoid non-normalizing. No, absolutely, that's a good point. And I think we try to do a lot of personalization. So we see that if someone is not engaging with, uh, let's say, people recommendations, we stop sending those to them altogether. So we don't have it predefined, but uh, uh, we, we do some of what you're saying, but it's highly personalized. Uh, since we collect all the it's slightly different so essentially you will try to first show them a people recommendation then you get the feedback that they're not yep. doing anything right. so every so often you need to keep reintroducing that yep. right. to see if they they get interested in the future yep so you, so you are sort of doing that sort of doing that but not in a fixed order uh, yeah do you want to add something to that? and we don't like notifications are special because you don't get you can't display a full search page of notifications right you you get very few chances to send it so you you do want to send the best one at, at that particular po point in time. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Okay. Hello, here. Uh, so there are like two paths, completely different. One is the pull path, and one one is the push path. Right. Uh, do you in any way somehow cooperate those two paths? Because or do you like care about situation when you push a notification and it isn't yet visible on the timeline? That can happen because uh, they are completely independent paths, so you might tip it, it. But do you even care about it? Um, we do care about it. We want to make sure that every time you get pushed and you go back to your timeline, you see it in your timeline. So that's the ideal experience, and that's what we strive towards. But there are cases when they can be out of sync, but it's very rare. OK, but do you somehow coordinate those two things? Uh, yes, yes, okay. we do. So the the, the the notification write path that we mentioned earlier, it forks off on two different paths. So it basically makes sure that um, when we send something out for push delivery, it's also stored in the cache at the time. So it kind of uh, is the gatekeeper for that. OK, thanks. Hi there, you mentioned multi-DC. Um, can you quickly talk about is some of the stuff running in parallel in multiple DCs? And are these all your own infrastructure or is some of that public cloud as well? I can take that. So on Twitter, we run our own data centers. So everything's internal to Twitter. Uh, and we do have to run things in parallel because users can switch between DCs. Uh, yeah, so every, you have to have redundant, you have to be able to serve, from, serve your notification timeline out from different DCs. But is, is everything, like, are you, the whole population of Twitter, are you running that all in parallel in every DC, or have you sharded across DCs somehow? Uh, we would, you would have to have enough redundancy to make sure that you are resi resilient enough. So your event might arrive in one DC, but then get replicated onto the other one. But we do have the duplication. So you were talking about the labeled data. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you can go back. but So as people interact with your phone, you're getting sort of feedback. So you can determine. Um, so, so that feedback is to. One is to determine if they're interacting with a candidate source. 
uh, what else, uh, how else are you using it? And they're using a glo building global model. So let's say a bunch of people click on the moonlight thing. Now that should increase the relevance globally, right? Uh, are you using that to feed a global model that will feed into the personalized models for everybody? So, I mean, there's many models running at the same sure. time. Like we have a model for the top end followings that would use some of these features. Uh, the rank for this specific slide on the rank, uh, it's a global ranking across different candidate sources. So we this use- This is only for candidate source ranking. Yeah, so we gather all the candidates. Mm -hmm. So if you have 100 candidates, some of them might be hashtags, some of them might be photos, and you kind of need to decide whether you want a hashtag or a photo recommendation. Okay, uh, okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, uh, everyone. Thank you. We'll have to end it here. Uh, we continue this track in this room, 11.50. And if you, and if you have any questions, feel free to ping us and we can talk offline. <laughs>